Romans 6, and um, we're going to be looking tonight at verses 1 to 7, 1 to 7. Um, Bradley, would you do the honours please? Yep. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us, are, as were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we all should walk, should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Thank you. Anyone never read Romans 6 before? Please raise your hand. Most people, or everybody, has read it before. Are they not absolutely amazing words? Mm -hmm. In in a whole number of senses. Uh, In the sense that that, uh, they're amazing promises to us as, as Christians, but also tremendously uh, challenging, you know. And I've often thought, you know, if if a minister or a Christian preacher went to a church and basically preached that without using Paul's words, but just saying the same thing, but using different words and different phrases, I wonder what the reaction would be uh, amongst the congregation. I wonder how they would respond to that. Would some people say, well, that's not what the Bible teaches. You know, that's not the Christian life because it is just so incredibly uh, challenging. What does he say in verse 2? How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? I mean, just pondering that verse, you think, wow, you know, what an incredible uh, statement to make so I want to kind of go slowly through it if we can and consider a lot of the things that Paul is saying here because uh, uh, this is really a question of sin isn't it and sin in in the life of the believer and what part what place does sin have in the life of a Christian so um, first of all uh, we'll start with verse one what shall we say then shall we continue in sin that grace may abound. Now what Paul is doing here is really referencing something that he said uh, a number of chapters before. So if you go back to Romans 3, Romans 3 um, and 7 to 8 says this, For if the truth of God hath more abounded through my lie unto his glory, why yet am I also judged as a sinner? And not rather as we be slanderously reported, and as some affirm that we say, let us do evil that good may come, whose damnation is just. So that argument that he has there in Romans 3, he's saying, uh, because God's grace abounds, when, when sin abounds, he's saying, uh, people are actually saying that we're telling others, oh, you know, carry on in sin. It's all right. In fact, it's good that you carry on in sin because you make God look so much more righteous, so much more gracious. Mm-hmm. And he's saying we're being slanderously reported that this is what we're saying. He's saying we're not saying this at all. And so coming back to Romans 6, again, he, he, he is addressing that issue and putting it in more if you like, explicit terms, more obvious terms. Shall we, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? So how shall we that are Christians that say we have this new life within us, that say we've been saved from, from sin, how shall we now continue in that that, that sin is that how we should live God forbid Paul is saying and this issue is such an important issue you know um, I was just watching um, uh, Ray Comfort um, the new movie Audacity I've not seen it yet um, where he talks 
about the issue of homosexuality and he, he talks to two, um, two lesbian women and uh, he says to, to one of them, do you believe in God? And she says, yes. And she says, well, I, I, something like, I gave my heart to Christ. And he says, yes, but it's not enough to say that. You have to then repent of your sins and, and live a life that is, is fitting with that. You know, you need to produce, if you like, uh, uh, fruit in keeping with that repentance. There needs to be some evidence. And this is pretty much what we've been talking about all through Romans or for, for quite a while in Romans. And that is the issue of righteousness, isn't it? You know, uh, are we simply, do we simply have that righteousness imputed to us? Does God just simply see us as righteous, but we can live how we want? Or does it go deeper than that? Is the, is the, does that righteousness become our experience? Does God do something to us that actually changes us? changes our heart, changes our mind, and therefore ultimately changes the way in which we're living. You know, is that part of the, the promise that God is giving? Is that part of the gift that he's giving when he gives us that gift of salvation? Now, in a lot of churches, I heard a phrase, and it, it, it's a phrase, and I kind of know what people mean, but it's a phrase that I take exception to, and, and I'll explain to you why in a minute. So don't anybody jump, jump on me when I say this. But you'll hear a lot of Christians say, well, I am a sinner saved by grace. Now, in one sense, I believe that's true. We're obviously, we all have sin. John says, if you say that, you know, you don't have sin, then you're a liar. You know, because of course, we have all sinned against the Lord. If we're honest, we must accept that. I am a sinner saved by grace. But what it means is that in the past, that's how I behaved. I was a quote sinner but now I've been saved by grace what it doesn't mean is I, I I was a sinner I'm still a sinner I'm continuing my sin but that's all right because my salvation is by grace and if you look in the bible the term sinner almost always has a negative connotation it is always denoting an enemy of God and I'll just give you some examples to support that. If you just have a look at Psalm 1. We'll be looking in, in the Old and the New Testament. So Psalm 1. <coughs> um, Psalm 1 verse 5. Psalm 1 verse 5 says, Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment nor here it comes sinners in the congregation of the righteous so if you're a sinner you won't stand in the congregation of the righteous okay let's have a look at uh, Luke in the New Testament Luke 6 So this is Jesus talking to his disciples. And if you do good to them which do good to you, what thank have ye for sinners also do even the same. See, he's differentiating between his disciples and sinners. He's saying, well, you know, if you if you do good to those who do good to you, you know, what, what's the difference? Even sinners do that. See, he has that negative connotation. And then uh, finally, first Peter First Peter four um, eighteen. First Peter four eighteen. And if the righteous and if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? So there's the righteous, those who are righteous by uh, uh, believing on the Lord. Uh, they have that, that righteousness imputed to them uh, through faith. And yet he's saying, you know, uh, here's the righteous, they're scarcely saved. What's going to happen then to the ungodly? And there's that word, that phrase, and the sinner. So, uh, but you might say, well, hang on a minute. Doesn't, the, doesn't Paul say that he is the chief of sinners? 
That's true. He does. He says, he says, uh, uh, of, of whom I am chief. But, but again, we were talking about it earlier. Always look at the context. Always look at what the words are surrounding it to fully understand what is being said. So we'll have a look at that. First Timothy. Um, yeah, First Timothy, chapter one. It is. One Tim one and verse fifteen. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. Well, sounds a bit like he's saying, you know, uh, I'm the worst sinner of them all, but he came in, he saved me, you know. But is Paul indicating then that he continues in that sin, that he's continuing that, that, that life of sin? Well, have a look at verse 13. Context, who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious. In other words, you caused injury to others. So is Paul still a blasphemer now that he's a Christian? Is he still persecuting the Christians. Is he injuring them and hurting them? No, he's not. So I believe the context there, he's looking back and saying, I'm the chief of sinners because I did all this. You know, I actually persecuted Christians. I arrested them. I took them in chains. You know, I had them killed. And you remember when we read about Stephen being martyred, the first Christian martyr, who's there holding the clothes of those who are stoning him? Saul of Tarsus or the Apostle Paul as he was going to be. So none of that shows that um, the Christian should carry on in sin. And this phrase of, you know, I am a sinner saved by grace. You see how that would be misleading. Uh, uh, it might make people think, well, OK, so I'm just I just carry on in sin. And, and you know, if you're somebody who shares the gospel with others and you're going out and, and you say, oh, you. You, know, you need to come to Jesus, you need to repent of your sins and turn to him. You need to turn away from sin and be born again by the Spirit of God. Are you turning from sin? You know, is it not hip hypocrisy to tell others to say, look, you, you can't carry on sinning like this. You must turn. And yet you, you think it's so, but me, I'm all right. I'm in there with God because I've been saved. It's OK for me to, to commit sin. You know, sh what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin? That grace may abound. God forbid. Paul says, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? So, what does dead to sin mean? Well, I, I believe that Paul is teaching not only that it is possible uh, to be dead to sin, but he is expounding with great clarity what that actually means. He says that we should not live any longer therein. Isn't that what it says? That we should not live any longer therein. So what Paul's talking about is, is a double blessing, I believe, it, uh, uh, of what we call salvation. That when salvation comes, it's a twofold blessing. That we are delivered from the guilt of sin... That's our justification, our pardon before God. Yes, when you become a Christian, you are delivered from that guilt of sin. But also that we may be delivered from the power of sin. Uh, that is our sanctification. So do you get that? Salvation involves justification and sanctification. The first blessing is our justification. Like as if God is a judge. And he sort of says, you know, bangs the gavel, that's it, all charges are now dropped, you're not guilty, you're free to go now. Um, that's the first blessing. The second blessing is our sanctification. The Holy Spirit comes and lives within us and we experience a separation from sin. That's what sanctification means, to be washed clean, to be separated from sin and to be consecrated to God, to serve him and many people accept the first blessing justification yes but many are not even aware that there is this this further blessing it's just not taught you know it's not taught in their churches they've never heard it before and so they go on uh, and they, they you know what are they being taught from the pulpit well don't worry about it you know paul suffered with it 
Romans 7. If we could, we'd look at 6, 7 and 8, all three chapters tonight. We haven't got time to do that. But just bear in mind that uh, uh, to understand what Romans 7 is teaching, you know, where Paul says, oh, you know, what that which I want to do, I can't do and, and, and so forth. You know, do you know the passage I'm talking about? Yeah. So let's just briefly look at it. Romans 7 um, verse 15 is for that which I do, I allow not for what I would that do I not. But what I ha hate that do I. It's a little bit contrived in the King James, I'm afraid. But it's basically saying, you know, uh, <clears throat> I want to do this, but I can't do it. And the thing I don't want to do, that's the thing I keep on doing all the time. Well, I believe and we'll get on to it. I believe that Paul is actually reflecting on his life as a Jew under the law. Not everybody agrees with that, but I do believe that's what he's saying because he also says in verse 18, uh, for to will is present. So Romans 7, 18, if you're taking notes. Uh, for to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good, I find not. That is, it is classic uh, legalism isn't it a classic trying to live your life to please God through the law trying to do the right thing but f how to do it I find not I can't do it why because you have this fallen nature uh, you can't please God it means God has to change your heart in order for him to, he has to come and dwell put his spirit within you mm -hmm. in order that you can overcome temptation or you can overcome sin you're just trying to live the Christian life and you don't have the Holy Spirit within you Good luck. You're not going to last very long. And that's what I believe Paul is talking about in Romans 7. His frustration. We must, we must balance that against Romans 6. Don't forget, same epistle written by the same man. We have to understand it. Okay, so um, these, this idea of justification and sanctification are at the heart, not just of Paul's ministry, but of Jesus' ministry as well. Do you remember in Matthew 1, 21, uh, Matthew says, uh, uh, recording what, what is said, he says, Thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. He'll save them from their sins. Remember, I'm a sinner saved by grace. Well, Jesus is going to save you from your sins. Uh, again, John 1, 29, John the Baptist says, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin, singular, of the world. He takes away the sin of the world. And John 8, 11, the woman caught in adultery, Jesus says to her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Wow. But, but how can she go and sin no more? Well, Jesus says she can go and sin no more. So let's have a look uh, how Paul continues to explain this. Verse 3. Um, know ye not that so many of us as were baptised into Jesus Christ were baptised into his death. Remember that phrase we looked at in verse 2. Dead to sin. Now why does Paul now start talking about baptism what's the what's the significance well baptism he's not talking about like in the church of england where they sort of sprinkle babies and that kind of thing he's talking about full immersion baptism where where a person an adult goes under the water the water covers them completely and then they come up again and the whole significance of that is burial that's what it's a picture of it, it, it's reminding the person that jesus christ uh, died, was buried, and then he rose again in, in resurrection power. Uh, and, and what it is saying is that when you become a Christian, this is an outward uh, demonstration of what has already happened to you. you know, we're not saved by baptism. It doesn't just, you know, you don't get outwardly baptised somebody, whoa, now you've just become a Christian. No, it, it is an outward show of what has taken place within the person's heart. And what that is, is that as Paul puts it, that our old man, verse 6, our old man is crucified with him, with Christ. And, and this is why I take exception to a lot of um, uh, counselling, Christian counselling ministries that deal with people and sort of say, oh, well, you see, 
um, you know, you had these problems before you came to Jesus. You know, you, you had a bad relationship with your father, or that, so you find it hard to relate to God as father. Or, you know, you, 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 you were involved in the occult and all this sort of stuff. So now you've got all these kind of uh, uh, demonic problems around you. That you've, you're saved, but you need a lot of help now to kind of get rid of all these issues and problems that you still got with you. My problem with that is that the Bible says when you become a Christian, you're a new creation or a new creature. That the old has passed away, hasn't it? All things become new. So think of that picture of baptism. Whatever you were before you became a Christian dies and is buried. And when you come up out of that water, that is symbolic of what's happened to you. You have become a new creature in Christ. So, so that, that, you know, Satanist or, or witch or whatever it was, is dead. Forget it. They're, they're dead. They're buried. Somebody new has come, has emerged out of the water. You know, that, that alcoholic is dead. Somebody new has emerged out of the waters of baptism. You know, that, that whatever it is, that abused child or that, that drug addict or whoever you were, that person's dead. Now you are a new creature in Christ. And what I don't like is a lot of people seem to be saying, no, come on, you know, dig that corpse up. W walk around in it. Put it on yourself. You know, you need, you need help. What you need is faith to reckon yourself to be dead to those things in Christ. Uh, and if you have that, you'll have a powerful uh, uh, and victorious Christian life. But it involves, um, involves faith. So, this is why Paul says, he that is dead is freed from sin. Read that there in, in, in verse 7. So, um, let, me, uh, let me quote to you, hang on. Yeah, I quote to you. This is this, this is this is from from John Wesley. No surprise. So he, but this is this is. I like the way he puts this. He says, "Our evil nature, that entire depravity and corruption, which by nature spreads itself over the whole man, leaving no part uninfected. This inner believer is crucified with Christ, mortified, gradually killed." By virtue of our union with him. Yes, the, there is this initial death and whatever is left is, is crucified, is dealt with as we walk with Christ. There's this gradual sanctifying process which you've you probably heard of. You know, the sanctification grows. It, it, it starts in the heart but then it grows. It starts to make its way into uh, the rest of our lives. So that we can we can say with the apostles, that, and particularly Apostle John, who agrees with, with Paul, who says, Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, and he cannot sin. 1 John 3 verse 9. Now, we're not studying 1 John tonight, uh, uh, so, so forgive me if I can't do justice to all that statement. But it's one heck of a statement, isn't it? You know, uh, and and I'm guessing that many will be sat here listening to this and saying, yeah. The problem is, that's not my experience. <laughs> you know, if we're honest, most of us, if you're a Christian here tonight, you're saying, I know what it says. I, and I asked everybody at the beginning, who's read Romans 6? Everyone's read it. We've all read the words. We all know what it says. But we're saying, but how come... That isn't my experience. How come I am sinning? How come, you know, I'm, I, I, it just doesn't seem to match up, really, to what Paul is saying here. Well, let me answer that in a number of ways. Firstly, I think it is very dangerous to establish doctrines, Christian doctrines, by simply what we experience. You know, if I just say, oh, well... Well, this is my experience, therefore this is what, what the Bible teaches, this is what I believe. Very dangerous. You know, please give me chapter and verse, not your experience. Because we can all be deceived, it's what the Bible teaches, isn't it? 
Mm. Be not deceived, be not deceived. says that just so many times in the New Testament. Why? Because it's so easy to be deceived about these things. So therefore, let's stand on something sure and firm. Let's stand on the Bible. What does the Bible say? Where, what does it teach? So that's the first thing. Um, we must be very careful about using our own experiences. Um, also, we must be very careful if we say, well, you know, I've never met anybody who, who, who lives a life like that. Well, it doesn't mean they don't exist. It doesn't mean that there aren't people somewhere who are living what Paul describes and what John describes. Just maybe you haven't met them yet. You know, so we, we have to take the Bible as, as the sole uh, rule of doctrine. Now, the Bible also teaches that Jesus Christ is the saviour of the whole world, doesn't it? And that he's the propitiation, not just of our sins, but of everybody's sins. So Jesus is the saviour of the whole world. I'm not a Calvinist, so I don't believe in the limited atonement. I believe that Jesus died for everybody. Is everybody saved? Plainly no. So, so just bear that in mind as we come to this concept now, what Paul's talking about here, that a Christian shall not continue in sin, that a Christian is dead to sin, and, and that he might henceforth, verse 6, that henceforth we should not serve sin, shouldn't even serve it. So what we have is a promise here. Has everyone taken up the promise? No, not at all. If you're in a church where from the pulpit they're saying, of course you can't overcome sin, of course it's inevitable you're going to commit sin, then are you likely to believing to be believing this and think, yeah, I can overcome this? You're going to say, no, uh, no, the guy at the top, the pastor, the elder says there's no way. He, he knows better than me. He's been to Bible college, so he must know more about the Bible than me. So, so it, it militates against the acceptance of this doctrine of sanctification totally you know it, you're fighting against what the bible is saying here i believe that the reason we as christians do not live like this or or rarely live like this or live for a short period like this and then seem to fail again is because it is conditional yeah just like salvation jesus died for everybody but it's conditional it's conditional upon you Repenting of sin and believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. And I believe it's the same with this. It's conditional. It involves two things. Yielding. It involves surrendering to the Holy Spirit. It, mean, it involves you surrendering your will up to God and allowing him to do it. Now, we don't always do that because our will is our own. Sometimes we might want to yield. Other times I might think, I don't want to yield to God. You know, I'm annoyed. I'm irritated. I didn't get much sleep last night. My wife's annoying me. You know, or whatever it is, we don't respond in the right way. Sorry, one's wife is annoying one. <laughs> we don't respond in the right way. Therefore, we don't yield to the Holy Spirit. Therefore, we don't live like Paul is describing here. Secondly, it involves... Believing involves abiding in the strength that is in Christ. I mean, it involves the exercising of faith and understanding that we can't do it ourselves, but that strength is available in Christ. And it's those two elements, yielding and believing, that you need in order to overcome sin, and in order to live as Paul is describing here in verses uh, uh, 1 to 7. And we'll get on to... Uh, in the next session we'll get on to what he's talking about here about the power of the resurrection walking in the newness of life I don't really want to touch on that this time but I will look back at it when we, when we look at it I'm going to finish with a, a nice heavy theological quote um, because I thought this was very interesting this is from um, James Arminius or Jacobus Arminius and um, what's interesting about it is he is, he is speaking in defence of uh, the accusation of Pelagianism, or Pelagianism, you've heard of that. Pelagianism is, Pelagius was a heretic, basically, who, uh, Pelagianism teaches that, you know, yeah, if you don't want to sin, just stop sinning, right? Just don't do it, just, 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 just walk in obedience to God. And what it does, it denies the need for salvation by grace. 
Jesus, you can you can just you know you can just live without just just stop doing it and just just live right. And so what James Arminius is doing here is he's defending himself against the accusation that he is a Pelagian or a semi-Pelagian. But what he does, what's interesting is he quotes Augustine in his defence. Augustine is like the godfather of Calvinism, really. You know, Calvin cites him just over and over. He's Calvin's hero. Uh, he's a lot of people's heroes. But, but so here, what Arminius does is he quotes from, from Augustine. So I thought it was nice and balanced. So... All right, so this is Arminius first. He says, I do not produce these passages as if I thought that either my brethren or I must abide by the sentiments of the fathers. That's the church fathers like Augustine. But only for the purpose of removing from myself the crime of Pelagianism in this matter. So now he quotes Augustine. St. Augustine says, we must not instantly with an incautious rashness oppose those who assert that it is possible for man to be in this life without sin. For if we deny the possibility of this, we shall derogate both from the free will of man, which desires to be in such a perfect state by willing it, and from the power or mercy of God, who affects it by the assistance which he affords. He goes on to say, this is again Augustine, If I be asked, is it possible for a man to exist in the present life without sin, I shall confess that it is possible by the grace of God and by man's free will. Wow. So, he's saying, don't dismiss somebody who says it's possible to live like that without deliberately committing sin. Now, this is just just to add, finishing with this now. Just to add a little caveat there. Okay, we don't have perfect knowledge, so it is impossible to really just sort of because there are sins of omission as well as sins of commission. But but knowing everything that we can, if we face every situation where there's a temptation, is it possible that we can see that temptation and choose God's way? rather than the temptation, you know, rather than succumb to the temptation. That is in effect what he's saying. Is it possible to look at every temptation and say, actually I'm going to go God's way? He's saying, well, I can't out rule that out because God is gracious enough. We know that because the Bible says that if we're tempted, you know, uh, uh, we're not tempted beyond what we can bear, but God will make the way out for us. So, and if, and if man's will wants it, if man, if man is willing and wants that, he's saying, I can't rule that out. And so, you know, let's not be rash. Let's not dismiss people who say it might be possible to overcome every temptation that faces you, given if we always choose the grace of God. And that effectively, I believe, is what Paul is saying here in Romans 6, that it is possible to overcome temptation if you are willing and if you accept the grace that God has given at that moment.